When I wrote Wichita Lineman, Glenn had called me and said, I need a follow-up for by the time I get to Phoenix. Stop me if you've heard this one before. The famous French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre is sitting in a cafe in Paris and he calls the waitress over and says, could I have a cup of coffee please with no cream? And the waitress says, oui oui, and scurries off to the kitchen. A few minutes later she comes back and says, je m'excuse, monsieur Sartre, but we don't have any cream, we're all out. Would you accept a cup of coffee with no milk instead? The point of the joke, if it needs to be explained, is that Sartre, in his most famous work at being and nothingness, argues that absence is as much a part of the properties of an object, which he called being in itself, the intrinsic properties of something or someone's nature and identity, and being of itself, which includes its ability to know itself, define and redefine itself, and to transcend itself. So coffee with no cream, coffee with no milk, and black coffee are three separate entities which have not transcended their fundamental states. In 1968, Glenn Campbell, one of the great behind-the-scenes guys in the cadre of Los Angeles session musicians known as the Wrecking Crew, recorded a new song written by Jimmy Webb, who at 21 had already gained a stellar reputation as a songwriter, winning Grammys for Up, Up and Away by the Fifth Dimension, and By the Time I Get to Phoenix, which Campbell had also recorded. The song which, as far as Webb was concerned, was still unfinished, was Wichita Lineman, and it became the song, the record, which, to my mind of thinking, comes closest of any song I've ever heard in encapsulating Sartre's arguments about beings in state, transcending that state, and redefining themselves. While it was a number one country hit, and Campbell is generally seen as a country artist, there's never been a country song like Wichita Lineman. There has hardly ever been a song in post-war popular music like it. Take the music, for example. Country music usually concerns itself with half a dozen or so standard chord progressions, usually involving the tonic, the subdominant, and the dominant chords. But Wichita Lineman, with its bed of interchanging minor and major sevenths, the jarring unexpected chords that resolve each half of the verse, especially the B-flat that comes in at... Is still on the And the fact that it changes key in the middle of the verse from F major to the unexpected D major, for those not so familiar with theory, and I don't claim to be any kind of expert myself, one would much more expect it if it was going to change key to go to D minor, which is more closely related to F. The song has a strophic form, that is, it has no chorus. In fact, it doesn't even have a bridge, which is fairly uncommon in country songs. Although Hank Williams did write a few, I'm so lonesome I could cry, hey good looking, etc. There's also the string arrangement, which is an object use of prosody to describe in the Aelian harp-like string arrangement the singing in the wire and the organ flute Morse code effect. Country music wasn't immune to prosody. Harmonicas and steel guitars had long been used to evoke trains. But this was groundbreaking, not just for the limitations of the genre, but for pop music as a whole. From the moment Carol Kay, unmistakable, plays that six-note intro, the arrangement gives a huge feeling of space, of distance, lifting Campbell's voice, sounding in a wild and unfathomable wilderness. Remarkable as it was an arrangement for a country song, one thing it does have in common with the common tropes of that country music is that it is an incredibly sad song, with the lyric that approached the nature of man's existence, destiny, love, alienation and freedom in ways that no song in the genre had ever done so before. It was a song about being in the face of a vast and unfathomable nothingness. Billy Joel once described it as a song about an ordinary man who thought extraordinary thoughts. Loath as I am to disagree with an eminence as eminent as Billy Joel, I find it the opposite. It's a song about an ordinary man who in some way fears the consequences of thinking extraordinary thoughts. I am a lineman for the county, our narrator declares in the opening line, searching in the sun for another overload. Let us set aside for the moment the fact that phone lines don't overload, power lines do. In the sun is an evocative line, implying wherever and whenever the sun shines, he is what he is, a lineman for the county. He is trapped in what Sartre calls an ontological duality. Ontology is the branch of metaphysics which deals with what exists and what doesn't. His being in itself is his reality. He tells his 
lover in song that she is a fundamental element of his experience. She exists in a transcended form, being of herself, as a voice in the wires, as an echo in the wine and the wind. But he can't change his being in itself and the relationship between them. But, conditioned as we are to hear every song as a love song until the text tells us directly otherwise, this is not a love song between Campbell and some flesh and blood proposition. Despite the longing that the music conveys, we assume that he cannot join his lover. He is the Wichita lineman, and despite it all, he is still devoted to his purpose. The lineman exists solely for the lines. They are his love, not some winsome Kansas cutie pie in a gingham dress waiting in a little house on the prairie. He recognises his plight in the second verse. He needs to separate himself from his identity, but he fears it. He fears not being needed by the line as much as he fears not being needed by his lover. He should take a break and go to her, but he can't justify it, and what he imagines to be the consequences of abrogating that responsibility weighs on him. Although this represents an interesting train of thought, if he's indeed from Wichita and works in Sedgwick County, then that particular county actually gets less snow and less rain than not only the rest of Kansas, but it's below average for the whole USA. And therein he realises the paradox of his existence, the unresolved dialectic that stops him being able to transcend to being in himself. You know I need you more than want you, and I want you for all time. What is he talking to here? Is he talking to, as we've assumed from the first verse, an absent lover who has become elemental to his experience? Or is he talking to the singing wires, his own identity, the job, the isolation, his own sense of freedom being all he has? It's an impossibly romantic line. It's the opposite of Brian Wilson, or more correctly, Tony Ashes. I may not always love you, but as long as there are stars above you. Whereas that lyric defines and confines love as lifelong. Wichita's lineman wants this to go on for all time. He needs it because it is what he is, and he wants it for all time because he recognizes he is incapable of realizing himself beyond it and the lines will always exist. It is the fundamental existential trap. The tragedy in the song is reinforced in another of Sartre's ideas in being and nothingness, that the center of existence is nothingness, and that the source of all human freedom lies in the ability to move from what one is to, to what one can be. Sartre posits that man is condemned to be free, because within the nothingness lies choice volition and action regardless of the and this is a difficult concept for me to get my head around circumstances of the nothingness around them it's like the cream and the coffee even a state of nothingness is a state of something dual ontology the lineman cannot realize his freedom because he cannot recognize or he won't use his free will to be free he knows he should take a vacation, get away from the wires, but he feels responsible. He feels beholden to them. He knows he is trapped and he resents them. He needs them more than he wants them. But trapped as he is, he wants them for all time. Another key tenet of being a nothingness is the notion of mauvais foi, or bad faith, that the lineman will lie to himself and us in order to escape what he calls the anguished responsibilities of freedom. The lineman denies that he has power to become free, rationalizing that he is needed in case it snows down south. The lines need him. He needs the lines. And in this mutual lead, he thinks he can never be free. Sartre states that one of the chief ways that people deny their own freedom is by accepting social roles that they impose over their own being. They make themselves objects rather than humans with volition. The lineman here is a case in point. The other key factor in Sartre's philosophy is called le regard, or the look. This is a bit like what is known in quantum physics as the Copenhagen interpretation. Copenhagen posits that quantum particles exist in states of superimposition in multiple states, in multiple locations, and then in observing them, the observer settles the final choices to their relative position. Sartre says that a person's perception of their self is changed by the awareness that they're being observed by others. The lineman, so solitary, fears change and therefore fears observation, which is why he remains, by choice, still out on the line. Like the cream and the coffee, choice and no choice are both discrete entities. They are a something created out of nothingness by an act of volition. Jimmy Webb was an Oklahoma boy, son of a preacher man who moved to California when he was 18. Despite Campbell having had a big hit with Webb's by the time I get to Phoenix, the two did not meet until sometime afterwards, until Webb dropped in on a session Campbell was playing for a TV commercial and introduced himself. The clean-cut Campbell, looking at Webb's hippie hairstyle, looked back down at his guitar and simply said, 
I ended about time you got a haircut. The conclusion sorted out. Webb later fielded a phone call from Campbell asking for another song with a place name in the title. Phoenix, Albuquerque and Oklahoma had all been used in the previous hit, so he turned his eyes 250 miles northeast to Wichita. Webb and Campbell went on to a long and very profitable partnership, both artistically and commercially. Webb amassed one of the most impressive and deeply important catalogues of songwriting in post-war American history. Campbell died in 2017 after a stellar career that included 29 top 10 hits. Webb is still working today, the elder statesman of American soul. It's unlikely that Webb set out to write the most profound existentialist thesis in American popular music, and maybe he didn't, maybe I'm just imagining it. But it's kind of cool that a song that is just so ubiquitous, so ingrained in the tapestry of our popular culture, can also help explain some of the defining philosophical discussion of the post-World War II era. It's kind of funny too that while jazz is seen as the music for eggheads and intellectuals and prog is often touted as the music of the more sophisticated listener, it was an Okie and a good old boy from Arkansas who came out with what may well be popular music's intellectual magnum opus, albeit by feeling it, not necessarily knowing it. 